APCO Educational Topic Number 25, Premature Rupture of Membranes. Amniotic fluid starts to be continuously produced at approximately 16 weeks gestation. Remember that it is primarily dependent on fetal urine production. Amniotic fluid allows for fetal movement and breathing, which are important for fetal skeletal lung and chest development. Decreased or absent amniotic fluid can lead to compression of the umbilical cord and decreased placental flow. Disruption of the fetal membranes leads to a loss of these protective effects and the developmental roles of amniotic fluid. The objectives of this video are to list the history, physical findings, and diagnostic methods to confirm rupture of membranes, identify risk factors for premature rupture of membranes, describe the risks and benefits of expectant management versus immediate delivery based on gestational age, and finally describe the methods to monitor maternal and fetal status during expectant management. PROM is premature rupture of membranes before the onset of labor. PPROM is preterm premature rupture of membranes occurring before 37 weeks estimated gestational age. This is a leading cause of neonatal morbidity and mortality and is associated with 30% of preterm deliveries. The consequences of PPROM depend on the gestational age at the time of occurrence. Persistent oligohydramnios at less than 22 weeks estimated gestational age leads to incomplete fetal alveolar development and the development of pulmonary hypoplasia. Infants born with pulmonary hypoplasia cannot be adequately ventilated. When PPROM occurs between 24 and 26 weeks, there is likely to be survival. However, there will be possible substantial morbidities from extreme prematurity. What are risk factors for PROM? Anything that weakens the strength of the chorioamniotic membrane. Here is the uterus. Here is the cervix, and this is the chorioamniotic membrane. An ascending infection from the vagina will weaken these membranes, so sexually transmitted infections and other lower genital tract infections such as bacterial vaginosis play a role as risk factors. This can be one reason why a short cervix is also a risk factor for PROM. The risk for PROM is also doubled for women who smoke. Other risk factors include a history of prior PROM, polyhydramnios, and multiple gestations will basically distend the chorioamniotic membranes. Other risk factors are similar to risk factors for preterm delivery, including a prior preterm delivery, bleeding during pregnancy, low socioeconomic status, and low body mass index. It is very important to be able to accurately diagnose when a patient has had rupture of her membranes. Patients may describe an obvious gush of fluid, or they may describe a steady leakage of small amounts of fluid. It can be confusing for during pregnancy there are many things that can mimic amniotic fluid. It could be urine, normal vaginal secretions of pregnancy, increased cervical discharge, semen, or just perineal sweat. For the physical exam, a sterile speculum examination should be performed to visually assess the cervix and to swab for cervical gonorrhea and chlamydia. A group B strep culture should be obtained as well. An ultrasound should be performed to assess fetal position as well as to assess the amount of amniotic fluid. Remember to minimize digital cervical examinations to decrease the risk of infection. For diagnostic testing, nitrogen paper is used for amniotic fluid as alkaline with a pH greater than 7.1 and vaginal secretions have a pH of between 4.5 to 6 so amniotic fluid will appear blue on nitrogen paper. Ferning refers to the pattern of arborization when amniotic fluid is placed on a slide and is allowed to dry. And finally, pooling refers to the filling of the speculum with amniotic fluid. Once we have confirmed that rupture of membranes has occurred, then we need to move on to management. How do we decide on expected management versus immediate delivery? The patient's gestational age, presence of clinical infection, placental abruption, labor, and fetal status all have to be taken into account. If the patient is term, greater than 37 weeks, approximately 90% of patients will go into spontaneous labor within 24 hours. Labor should be induced either at the time of presentation or the patient can be expectantly managed. Induction of labor reduces the time to delivery and the rates of chorioamnionitis, endometritis, and admission to the neonatal intensive care unit. If the patient does not go into spontaneous labor on her own, then labor induction should be performed with oxytocin. For patients who are preterm or less than 37 weeks, the risks of uterine infection versus the risks of prematurity need to be weighed carefully. For late preterm patients from 34 to 36 weeks and 6 days estimated gestational age, the management is the same as term, for the risks of infection outweigh the risks of prematurity. An induction of labor is started for these patients once rupture of membranes is confirmed. If the fetus is breached, then a cesarean section will have to be performed. 
If peep prom occurs between 24 weeks and 33 and 6, the risk of fetal lung maturity from prematurity is very high, thus it is important to administer corticosteroids, which enhance fetal pulmonary maturity. Antibiotics are administered to increase the latency period, which is the time between rupture of membranes and spontaneous labor. Note this important point. Antibiotics are administered because they have been shown to increase the amount of time before spontaneous labor. The antibiotics are not to treat an infection. If there is an infection present, diagnosed by uterine tenderness, fevers, and or increased white blood cell count, then delivery needs to be initiated. Assuming that there is no evidence of uterine infection, a patient with PPROM from 24 to 33 and 6 estimated gestational age will be admitted for inpatient hospitalization with ultrasounds to assess amniotic fluid volume and antepartum testing, such as non-stress tests. Delivery will be induced between 32 and 34 weeks. Remember again, however, if the patient develops evidence of uterine infection, then delivery will be immediately initiated. Pre-viable PPROM is rare, occurring in less than 1% of pregnancies. There are important risks of prematurity to discuss with this population. Pulmonary hypoplasia rates are approximately 10 to 20%, and prolonged oligohydraminose can cause fetal deformations and limb contractures because the fetus cannot move freely within the amniotic sac. Neonatal death and morbidity rates decrease with a longer latency period and advancing gestational age. There are also significant maternal complications that can occur with prolonged rupture of membranes with increased risks of systemic infections. The management for patients with pre-viable PPROM involves patient counseling and expectant management or induction of labor. Antibiotics and corticosteroids are not recommended before viability. This concludes the APCO video on PROM. We have reviewed risk factors, diagnosis, and management for this common obstetrical condition. Remember that management depends on gestational age and always consider the risks of uterine infection versus the risks of prematurity.